Hi, this is Lyle Lovett, welcoming you to TribFest 23. I hope you're enjoying this weekend of big ideas and important conversations about the future of our state and our country. No matter who you are or what you believe, please be courteous and respectful to everyone around you. And no matter where you call home, thank you for being here. That's right, even if you're not from Texas, the Texas Tribune Festival wants you anyway. Thank you guys so much for coming out and um, starting your day on a light and cheerful note as we <laughs> talk about abortion and the states. Um, I'm Eleanor Klibanoff, the women's health reporter here at the Texas Tribune. Uh, we've got a great panel um, set up. Before we jump in, a couple pieces of housekeeping. Uh, please silence your cell phones. Um, if you'd like to uh, use those cell phones to tweet or um, post on your social media of choice, it is hashtag TribFest23. We are going to talk amongst ourselves, um, and then we do want to hear your questions. Um, if you are interested in having your question discussed by our panelists, you can submit that at texastribune.org slash ask. Um, we're having a little bit of technical difficulties, so we're going to be handing around this mic. So bear with us as we do that. Um, and unfortunately, um, Representative Nicole Collier was unable to join us today, so um, we have three lovely panelists uh, to fill in the gaps there. Um, I will introduce each of them and then we'll jump right in. Um, Senator Carol Alvarado is a Democrat representing District 6 in Houston. She's served in the legislature since 2008, first as a state representative and now in the Senate, and she joins us fresh off of impeachment. <laughs> Um, which is not what we're here to discuss, um, <laughs> importantly. Um, Rebecca Traster is writer at large for New York Magazine, covering women in politics, media, and culture. She's the author of Good and Mad, The Revolutionary Power of Women's Anger, All the Single Ladies, and Big Girls Don't Cry. And Nancy Northrup is the president and CEO for the Center for Reproductive Rights. Under her leadership, the group has worked to expand and defend sexual and reproductive rights in 70 countries, although Texans know the group best for their work uh, fighting against the state's abortion laws for the last two plus decades. Um, and great, we are gonna jump right in and um, Senator Alvarado, I'm hoping you can start and sort of set the stage for us. 15 months ago, we overturned, this US Supreme Court overturned Roe v. Wade Texas is one of 13 states that is currently operating under a near total abortion ban. A couple other states have six week bans, 12 week bans. Um, tell us a little bit about right now, you know, what is happening in Texas when it comes to the impact of these bans on women, doctors, and health in Texas. Good morning, everyone. Thank you so much. You, you joked and said it's this cheerful topic but after the impeachment trial, I'm happy to talk about <laughs> anything else, even this stressful topic. Uh, and welcome to everybody who is visiting Texas. We're glad y'all are here. Well, since the uh, trigger ban passed, and there were a couple other bills that passed as well, you know, we've always thought, you know, for the last decade, at least since I've been in the ledge, that, okay, this is a horrible bill, but at least we have Roe v. Wade. We can still hold on to that. Some some glimmer of, uh, of hope there. And then we had Trump come in, this is why elections matter, y'all, and appointed an unprecedented number of Supreme Court justices. We've never seen that happen. And so we knew Roe v. Wade was under attack. But when the bill was passed, I thought, okay, you know, the other side, that's pretty smart, you're, you're prepared. And you, you do have to give it to them because they did play their cards pretty well, anticipating. And so the trigger ban went into effect right after the uh, Dobbs. And so now we have women, and I know that our good folks at the center will talk about this, but you've had, and let's, I hope you will put a, a name and a face to these individuals, women like Amanda from Austin, uh, Lauren, from Dallas, and many, many other women that have found themselves in 
damn near you know, tragic situations where their life has been on the line. We've heard from the medical community. They're afraid to lose their license. They're afraid to get thrown into jail and end their career. But we've heard and you've seen in the news reports how many women have had to travel and incur expenses. Uh, and it's not just that you can now go to a neighboring state because this is spreading like wildfire. Unfortunately, what happens in Texas doesn't stay in Texas. It spreads like a STD around the country. <laughs> and now we find ourselves with lawsuits. And thank you so much to the folks from the center for standing up for women and representing them in the courts. She does deserve a, an applause. So that, that's what we've seen. Women who have been near death and they've become um, ill with uh, septus, with other kinds of diseases and infections because the doctors have been afraid. And uh, I mean, there was, and I know she'll get more into this, but dire situation where you have one person who may not even, because of what she went through and was in ICU for three days, may not be able to have children at all moving forward. So that's how dire it's been. Well, that's a great setup. Thank you. Um, and Nancy, you can tell us a little bit, um, you know, this lawsuit, obviously, that you guys have filed in Texas and now similar litigation in other states. I mean, you guys are now fighting, uh, you know, on several different fronts in several different state courts. What has changed for you all since Dobbs? And what's your angle? What's your strategy now? So the Center for Reproductive Rights argued the Dobbs case in the Supreme Court, and we were well aware that the Supreme Court was going to overturn Roe versus Wade long before even the leaked draft opinion. Uh, it was clear because of the makeup of the court with Justice Amy Coney Barrett getting on the court. It was clear from the oral argument, which was just you know shocking. And so we began working many years ago at thinking about what is the post row strategy. And let me just you know step back. The Center for Reproductive Rights works all over the world. We work in Latin America, Sub-Saharan Africa, Asia, Europe, at the UN. And so we've actually seen progress in places where it was once thought impossible. And um, so one of the first things, you know, when our colleagues, uh, first when, you know, Trump came in and all of that, you know, I was speaking to our U.S. colleagues and saying, look, look around the world at your colleagues who have been able to make change where it's tough. So we started thinking about the one thing about the law is at least there's, you know, a, a lot of options for it, right? Because we have state law as well as federal law. Having a mic issue, right? I think that's me. I don't think it's her. You know, no. it's me. It's her touching them. Who's the mic issue? That's better, though. It's better. Whatever that's better. happened. That's better. Whatever happened seems better. Okay. Mm -hmm. You know, you have federal law, you have state law, you have you know constitutional law protected in the courts, you have legislation, you have executive action. So we've been thinking about all of those things, but just big picture, you know, post row. We have been litigating in the states where uh, abortion has been banned and criminalized. We have been working with the states that are moving forward. I mean, that's a, something for people to really step back and appreciate, which is that it's not that the, I often say, but then modify it, the US has moved backwards, one of four countries in the world that have moved backwards, but it's not the whole United States. It's the Supreme Court, and it's about half the states where about 25% of the people live. The other half of the states have been moving forward since Dobbs, passing shield laws, and we can talk about that later, passing stronger protections in their states. Obviously, the, the states like Michigan that have put reproductive freedom in their constitutions. But let me just talk about, because you talked about Aunt, uh, Amanda Zarowski's case and the other uh, women in that lawsuit. I mean, people really have to understand what Amanda went through. She and her husband, Josh, were expecting a very wanted pregnancy in 2022. And she learned at uh, 17 weeks that her water broke. And that is something that no fetus can survive. She was, the standard of care would have been to have an abortion. She was told that she couldn't. It was too dangerous for her to travel. She had to be at death's door, and that really happened three days later. She went home and within a very short amount of time developed sepsis, which was life-threatening, was in the ICU for three days. Family was coming in from around the country to be at her bedside. And luckily, Amanda did survive. 
but her fertility may not have survived. There was scar tissue on her fallopian tube from the infection. And so we're talking about people who are fighting for their lives and their health and their future fertility. And so we have sued the state of Texas to say that in medical emergencies, doctors have to be able to use their best judgment, which is what you want your doctor to do for your medical care. And we won a preliminary injunction in the trial court, and the state of Texas could have easily said, OK, we will settle this and make it clear that when you have an obstetric emergency, you can get abortion care. But instead, the state of Texas has chosen to appeal it, mm -hmm. try to get that injunction lifted so that women are in the circumstance that they are and pregnant people right now in Texas. So it's going to be argued November 28th in the Texas Supreme Court. And we have sued in other states as well. We have sued in Idaho last week. We sued in Tennessee last week. We filed a complaint against Oklahoma last week with the federal government. This is happening. It's a tip of the iceberg. The women who have been so brave who have come forward in the state of Texas and these other states. But it's happening all over the country. Right. Thank you. Yes. Um, Rebecca, um, to sort of build on that, I mean, you, as I noted, wrote a book about the revolutionary power of women's anger. We are, you know, every day hearing more stories of women sort of speaking up about their medical cases. But we're also hearing, you know, almost like, I think, unprecedented for this era, um, you know, outrage about the issue of reproductive rights that, um, like, as you said, many people sort of perhaps took for granted for 50 years under Roe. What has surprised you? What have you seen in the wake of Dobbs about the reaction from everyday people? It's, it's such a fascinating and complicated question because I hear all the time from people who say, why aren't there protests in the streets? Why aren't we marching about this? And, um, and I want to acknowledge that that is a reality, especially coming out of a Trump administration in which we saw a real rebirth of street protest, um, also in advance of the Trump administration in terms of the movement for black lives, obviously women's march, airport protests. Like We just had a sort of revival of street activism that had been kind of you know, in remission for several decades of, I'm afraid, somnambulance that helped get us here. And so there's a little bit of an expectation now, like, why aren't we out in the streets? And it's true that on this issue, we haven't been. I, but I think that there are reasons for that. I think in part, it's because a lot of the people who are the most dedicated um, and the most immersed in this and have, in fact, been fighting these battles from long before the Dobbs mm -hmm. decision were just immediately deep in the work. And some of that work is legal. Some of it is legislative. Some of it is the actual accessing of medication abortion, trying to figure out how to get the people who need care, the care that, that is accessible to them legally. So I think there was an immediate on the ground preparedness from the people who were most immersed in it. Mm -hmm. And I want to say that I was something I was very wrong about in my own anticipation of this happening. Because like Nancy, I given what I cover um, and the work that I do, this was very clear that this was going to happen. It was clear in Texas in, in September of 2021. And what I was afraid of was that some of that somnambulance and shock would actually continue, not just in terms of activism, but in terms of an electoral response, in terms of, I write about politics. And one of the things that I thought, knowing a little bit about the history of the political treatment of abortion as an issue, is that it would take a while for people to understand and act at the ballot box. Because abortion is the kind of thing that it can take a lot of data points for an individual to begin to say, wait a minute, and, and to understand what is actually at stake, that you have to vote about this, right? And I thought, especially after decades in which, and I've been critical of the way the Democratic Party has handled abortion um, in recent decades, especially after decades in which we have not actually been given a complete and energizing picture of what these issues are and how they're tied into everything, health care, family formation, um, housing, like all, criminal justice, all this stuff, there hasn't been like a a textbook explaining to people that this is absolutely tied into democracy, that there wasn't going to be an immediate flood to ballot boxes, and that it might take years before enough people accumulated their own lived experience of what these bans, the, the harm and cruelty of these bans, before they started voting on it. And I was really wrong about that part, because right away, what you've seen, and it's not in every state. I wrote a long story about this, and my editors put a big thing on the cover that says, abortion wins elections. And that's 
really true in a lot of places, but not everywhere, <laughs> and I understand that. Um, it, but we have seen electoral results in Kansas, in Kentucky. Um, we have seen people coming out in Ohio, the, you know, the 14 point win in Wisconsin. We have seen enormous um, electoral energy voters instantly in a way that I could not have anticipated, understanding that this was something that had electoral resonance. And now there are questions about that. That's not all good news because you actually also have to have politicians and parties who now know what to do with this energy. Um, and what to do with that engagement. And that's a real question strategically moving forward. But so in that way, I've actually been pleasantly surprised where I think what I hear from a lot of people is, why aren't we on the streets? And I'm like, okay, but a lot of people are at ballot boxes. Mm -hmm. so. Yeah, thank you for that. And uh, Senator Alvarado, you can offer the perspective from Texas on this idea of, you know, um, we are seeing, you know, uh, abortion win elections in Kansas and Kentucky on ballot measures, but also, you know, in Pennsylvania on mm -hmm. how people, individual candidates talk about this issue. Texas is not seeing that. Um, we, the Texas Politics Project found that 58% of Texas voters want the legislature to expand access to abortion. And yet, at the last election, three months after the overturn of Roe v. Wade, Republicans had their usual, you know, rousing success at the polls. What's the difference there between Texas and, say, Pennsylvania, Ohio, Kentucky? Well, Texas voters, uh, I mean, you, you were very correct, the majority of Texans want to see access. Um, but I, I don't think that they're fully aware of the detriment to the extreme, the cases that the center is representing. And of course, we don't have the ballot initiatives that would take two thirds in both chambers. I mean, you saw we needed two thirds last week and that didn't happen, right? Uh, so I think we need to be more educated on the issues. Uh, I don't know what would happen if we, if we could have a ballot initiative. I'm not sure how that would go here. But I think that we need to do a better job, all of us as policymakers, as the Democratic Party, um, and people that are running for statewide office and really put a, a name and a face to the impacts of this. I mean, think about it, too. We had the, the other bill that would criminalize people if you help pay for somebody's abortion or you gave somebody a ride or, gosh, when I first started being an activist in women's reproductive health, I was escorting women into the clinic at Planned Parenthood. And we also had people that would, were hand holders. I mean, anybody doing any of that, we would all be criminalized because you have this vigilante ban. So it's been very extreme here. And I, I think that's the difference that, that you see is that in, in Texas, it's, it's a lot more conservative. And, I, and most of the bills that have, been, that have passed, I mean, most of them are proposed by men. And, you know, it really upsets me because I said, how dare you? How dare you tell me what I can do and cannot do with my own body? I mean, men have the freedom to make all the choices, and I'm happy to see several sprinkles of men in here because it's not just a woman issue. This is a human issue that we all need to be concerned about. Well, and, I mean, tell me a little bit about this legislative session, which was, you know, the first post-Roe legislative session. I think there was a lot of fear in Texas among Democrats and reproductive rights advocates about, you know, the, the gloves have come off. What are they going to do now? But in fact, abortion was not really the primary issue. First time in about a decade that it wasn't a priority bill of leadership, because it always is, right? It's one of their red meat issues. Um, but I... Well, and let's take it a step further. We had a bill that was passed by Representative Ann Johnson mm -hmm. and Brian Hughes, who has sponsored some of these very extreme bills. Uh, I think it was House Bill 3058 that kind of takes a step back, but it's very limited. Right. It ensures uh, that doctors can treat ectopic pregnancies and premature... Premature... Or, um, uh, membrane. Ruptures. Right. Ruptured membrane. But... The bill basically lets doctors 
do their job. Imagine that. Let doctors <laughs> figure out what's best. <laughs> and I mean, interestingly, right, that bill passed and it did not contain the word abortion, right? I mean, it's a it, bipartisan bill that they're sort of... Right. Uh, it didn't. And uh, Senator Hughes and I did have conversations because they were trying to be very careful about it. And of course, they didn't want to you know, wake up <laughs> the other side, right? But you did still have, even after the um, trigger ban bill, you did have some legislators that still filed their bills. Thank God they didn't go anywhere. But punishing businesses that would promise to pay for an abortion or these special funds that would help women travel to other states. So it, it's still there, but luckily, and I think you know, because of the polling, they've seen that, hey, this, this could be bad for us. It's interesting because one of the things that I've noticed since Dobbs politically is that both parties in different ways are the dog that caught the bus, <laughs> right? So with Democrats, they suddenly, in, in this moment of profound and grievous loss, they have an activated majority eager to vote for something, but a leadership on a, on a, certainly on a federal level and a lot of Democratic Party leadership that has decades of no practice in how to talk about this fluently, right? There have always been legislators. Senator Alvarado was just saying how in 2011, yeah. she got up on the House floor when there was a, a vaginal probe bill being proposed and actually held up a vaginal probe, right? There have been, <laughs> there have been incredible politicians all over this country. Jackie Spire in California talking about her ectopic pregnancy around that same time. Gretchen Whitmer, now the governor of Michigan, talking about her ex in a, debating an abortion bill in, in this, when she was in the state house and um, talking about her experience of sexual assault, right? There have been mm. people who have been politicians and leaders who, uh, especially on state and local levels, have been trying to put a human face and stories, um, as Nancy is doing this work legally for years, but party leadership has been really unwilling to take this up and talk about it in terms of human experience, life, family, um, faith, all the things that the, the right wing kind of ate up in their decades-long mission um, to overturn Roe. And so now you have Democratic Party that has this majority, but it doesn't have the fluency in terms of how to speak about it politically, at least the generation that is still in leadership power. But on the other side, you have a Republican Party that has spent decades building massive infrastructure, right. dedicating resources in ways that the Democratic Party did not to state and local elections, building every school board, city council, state legislator to then have the power not just over state abortion laws, but over voting map maps, over gerrymandering, over voter rolls, right, controlling the, you know, the, the democratic breakdown that we're witnessing happening too, that built a judicial pipeline, that did all this work, that ate up that language of, of family values and, and faith and all of that around abortion. And they've caught the bus in this other way, which is it worked. <laughs> and now they're on the other side of this incredible, incredibly unpopular issue. And so you have both parties that are kind of absolutely caught in headlights from different mm -hmm. angles mm -hmm. about what do we do now? Good point. Yeah. Please. But I will say that I do think the conversation uh, among the Democrats in the Congress has moved a lot yes, in absolutely. the last 15 years. I mean, I think about when I used to go to the Hill 15 years ago and I used to say they, could, they would never say abortion. They would say pro-choice or Roe versus Wade, and then like that's all they wanted to say, right? They wanted the endorsements, whatever. They didn't know how to talk about abortion. And a lot of groups have worked really hard to move that along. And in particular, the other thing I was thinking about is, as you were talking was that also 15 years ago, it was always said that you know, funding coverage in insurance plans, including the federal insurance plans for employees, for Medicaid, um, that that was a non-starter. You hear it on the Hill all the time. It's non-starter, right? Coverage for abortion care, non-starter in federal programs. Mm -hmm. And you know the work, particularly of the reproductive justice groups, the women of color-led groups, both the state level and the national level, moved that dialogue so that now it is understood that if you are a Democrat in Congress, you better be supporting mm -hmm. uh, the EACH Act, which is about coverage. So they have, and they're, they now can say abortion. They can and, talk but I about think it. in part that because is a generation work. of politicians, and you're absolutely right, at all above all, a reproductive justice group that pressured Barbara Lee to, to 
first propose the, the opposition to the Hyde Amendment, which is a legislative yeah. rider that prevents federal insurance programs from paying for abortion, which even under Roe made abortion fundamentally inaccessible to, to poor people um, who needed care, went unchallenged, largely unchallenged. I mean, it was challenged in the beginning. There was a lot of debate about it and objections from both Democrats and Republicans when it, in the 70s when it first passed. But it got to the point where Obama himself at some point called it a tradition. It was, as Nancy says, it was like you couldn't touch it. And it came from a new generation of activists, the reproductive justice movement pressuring politicians, starting with Barbara Lee, the congresswoman from California, who, by the way, has also told her own story of abortion. In, in this period that you were holding a vaginal probe on the floor, that you, that Democratic politicians were really moved to speak about it in a different way, and it did help prepare for this new generation um, and, and this moment. But I still think a lot of people in leadership don't know how to do it with the authentic, authenticity and fluency. And the other thing I just want to mention, just so that people here do know and understand this, is that there is really active legislation before the Congress that would restore and make stronger the right to access abortion as a statutory matter, and that is the Women's Health Protection Act. And in the last Congress, it passed the House twice. So think about that. And it got 49 votes in the Senate. So it's that close, oh, wow. and people need to hold on to that. And people never thought, you know, back to before Roe versus Wade was overturned, and it was there, they didn't realize that Congress has the authority to enact nationwide protections for access to abortion care. And people cannot write that off and say it can't happen. Twice passing the House, 49 votes in the Senate, it's a real, uh, it's a real piece of legislation that could make a huge difference. So people need to hold on to, we are able to get that, depending on the outcome of the 2024 election. Mm -hmm. yes. Well, and tell, I mean, tell us a little bit more about that. I mean, like, you know, what would the Women's Health Protection Act do? And it's sort of journey through, um, I mean, you guys were working on this well before Roe was overturned. Absolutely. A decade ago, because we were litigating and playing whack-a-mole in the states, we have sued Texas so many times, sued Texas on the ambulatory surgical center requirement, on the admitting privileges that went to the Supreme Court, and, and both of those did, in whole women's health case you know, the forced sonograms, on and on and on. So we kept realizing that even with the constitutional protections that were eroding under Roe versus Wade, we couldn't stay one step ahead of what st states were doing. And the Women's Health Protection Act, like the Voting Rights Act, right? I mean, we have a constitutional right to vote, but the Voting Rights Act exists because in 1965, you know, there was less than 5% registration of African Americans in the state of Mississippi. You needed to have something stronger. And that analogy is for the Women's Health Protection Act. So it is a, a, it's a legislative right, a statutory right, uh, to be able to provide abortion care, to be able to access abortion care. It gives the Department of Justice uh, jurisdiction to enforce it. So both organizations like ours could sue, but so could the Department of Justice, which sued Texas over SB8 and the vigilante. But the Supreme Court was like, mm, we're not sure that the Department of Justice can sue Texas. What's the statutory right there? Um, but in a very fundamental way, it gets rid of the waiting periods and the target regulation of abortion providers. It provides that you cannot ban abortion as Texas has done. So it would make a huge difference. We need both things. We need affordability, that's the EACH Act, and we need to have actually the ability to, to have the right to access abortion care, which is the Women's Health Protection Act. And you, I mean, when we spoke before this, you were talking about how, like, um, I mean, a, a common criticism of that, right, is like, we're, we'll immediately end up in court, right? And it's going to get fought through the courts. But, you know, a lot of stuff ends up in the court. You guys are already in court. Um, so, <laughs> right. And you can't, you know, you can't not pass important legislation. And I also think that when a, when a right has been established, it's sort of with the Affordable Care Act, there was yeah. a battle over that legislation. That battle went through the courts. People once they have a right, are not going to want to see it taken away. That's what we saw in Kansas. That's what we saw, right, when they tried to take the right to abortion out of, we had won a case in state court in Kansas establishing the right to abortion stronger than the right under Roe versus Wade. And in 2022, after Roe was reversed, their legislature put to the voters, you know, would you like to give your right back? Would you like your right taken away? And the Kansas voters resoundingly said no. And it was another one of these situations where people were saying to me, I kept bringing up, you know, we've got to help defend in Kansas. People were saying, oh, there's no path to victory there. There's no path to victory there. And I was like, right? And it, it was a huge victory. 
You have to have the fight. Yeah. And you can't not fight. You can't be cowed. By, I mean, that is a small part of the story of, you know, how we got here. You got to be willing to have the fight. And you got to be willing. Look, you, Senator Alvarado said earlier that her opponents in some ways were really smart. I completely agree with that, though I disagree with every single thing they did in service mm -hmm. of that intelligence, yeah. right? Is that over these decades, they did, they built a judicial pipeline. They made stuff up about the width of hallways in clinics. They, they came up with laws telling doctors they had to give false information about connections that don't exist between abortion and breast cancer. They, they came up with lies and legislated them. And, and they lost a lot. They voted to defund P Planned Parenthood over and over and over again. And they lost and they lost and they lost and they lost and they won. But they, and, and we need to pay, there was creativity, there was fight, dastardly fight, there was strategy that was not just about a short-term win or loss. Mm -hmm. The building of a federalist society and state power in these legislatures happened bit by bit with tons of losses. And, and look at what they built. And I think that that those who are looking for a quick fix, it, it, there are all kinds of things that are happening. As Nancy said, there are states where things in the, I live in Maine where, where there was a huge expans, expansion of abortion access. Maine is not some blue state. Maine is a divided state. It's a small state. But, but the governor who is not a super left governor passed an expansion of abortion access throughout pregnancy, which is really important actually nationally because it, it is another place where people can safely go to get late abortion care if they need it. You know, there are lots of wins that can happen in the short term, but we also, everybody has to be prepared for the fact that, that this, got, this was decades in the making, and a lot of people also have to settle in to do work that's gonna take decades and incur losses along the way. Well, and let me ask you, I mean, in Texas, right? I mean, we're talking, yes, I mean, even to pass federal legislation, right? I mean, you've got Ted Cruz and John Cornyn, they're not uh, moving the needle on that. Um, and we've got, you know, the Texas Supreme Court. We've got, um, you know, federal judges in Texas, um, you know, who are appointed, um, who, you know, under President Donald Trump. We've got, you know, everything all the way down to House, you know, and city councils. Is the Democrat Party in Texas in it for the long haul? Willing? To, are you hearing those conversations about building that pipeline? Yeah, we have to be. And you laid it out very well what the opposition has done. They've been very strategic. They've been very organized. And we have to, we know that this is a long game, so you have to play it like that. But the, you know, obviously the quickest way to make a change is, is voting people out of office. It comes down to elections, y'all. It really does. Um, when you have every branch of government controlled by one party that wants to take away your right to vote, chipping away at that, we've done that. Texas has done a pretty good job at that. And the way it treats health care is really inhumane. Let's just lay the foundation. I mean, we have the largest population of uninsured people. So you've already got, that's where you're starting, your starting point. Then recently we've, we've had, for many reasons, now 900,000 people that have been kicked off of Medicaid. So you've got that. We've had, many of us have filed legislation to expand Medicaid in general. That has gone nowhere. We did have a little glimmer of hope with um, the bill, uh, I think it was HB 12. First part of Medicaid. Yes, we yes. expanded that from two months to 12. So. Right, which, I mean, is, is a huge change. Right. You know, it's um, in, te right. in Texas. Yeah. Um, so let's, yeah, we get a little, little right. relief there. <laughs> but, and that's a bill that I filed numerous sessions, but, you know, of course, leadership wasn't going to let a Democrat have that win. So, you know, sometimes it doesn't matter as long as it gets done, and, and it did. So, you know, kudos to this Senator Cole Kors. And right. And we should say, I mean, last, year, or last session, right, it, uh, they were trying to pass 12 months. They passed six months yes. and had some, you know, squirrely language in there that the federal government rejected. And now, you yeah. know, it almost fell apart yeah. this session and on an anti-abortion amendment. Yeah, Tony, so. Tony Rose, my colleague, she's been a champion on that. And I'm, I know Nicole, maybe she's watching, she's been a champion on that. And we've also talked about the disparities 
that this um, that these laws have, how it disproportionately affects women of color, African American women, Latinas, poor women, and maternal mortality as well. And we're, we are making some strides there, but uh, lack of having access to abortion does impact maternal mortality, and it impacts women of color even more. Well, and tell me, I mean, you know, abortion is uh, one piece of this, like, large reproductive, uh, any person's reproductive health journey. Does Texas, tell me about, like, Texas's safety net. You know, if we are undoubtedly going to see more children born, um, you know, that is somewhat explicitly the goal of some of this legislation. What is Texas doing to support those, like, moms and babies? Not a whole hell of a lot. I mean, there, there's, there's so much more we could be doing that we could build consensus. <gasps> the C word, mm -hmm. consensus. Uh, I think we could expand. I mean, we saw a little bit of that willing to cooperate on HB 12, but providing more access to uh, Medicaid, that, that's one. I, I think next session, maybe we can build on it, and then we'll see what happens in, in these next elections coming up in 2024. I mean, we've got to find a way to, to build on these states that have passed these um, ballot initiatives. How do we replicate that when it comes to voter turnout? How do we scare the hell out of folks and say, look, your freedom, <laughs> has been, you know, they've been chipping away at your, your right to vote, uh, women's reproductive rights. We have to build a better case, <laughs> really. I mean, you laid it out perfectly, but we need to work on that. Yeah, I mean, um, one of the things that stuck with me from covering this is, you know, Roe v. Wade overturned in June, outrage, right. anger in Texas. By November, Texas voters said abortion was the ninth most important issue to them that they were voting on. People were voting on inflation. They were voting on immigration. Border security, on, right, you name I mean, it. Right. It just doesn't, when there's not, when it's not on the ballot, mm -hmm. it's different, you know, it's not a yes, no vote, right? It's, you're voting for a person who's going to represent you in a body that people, you know, don't always spend a whole heck of a lot of time thinking about. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, you know, one question about this, Nancy. You guys are pushing in the courts on these cases about, um, you know, medical emergencies, wanted pregnancies that um, have, you know, people are facing sort of unexpected, horrible, tragic medical consequences. Do you see a path through the courts to tackle, like, the broader issue of abortion access for, you know, uh, the whole host of reasons that people have abortion in states like Texas? Uh, well, Texas, you know, many, many challenges have been brought to the trigger laws. You know, we sued on SB8, which is the vigilante law that was not struck down by the Supreme Court. Um, so Texas is a tough, you know, the, the pre-row bans, you know, all of these Center for Reproductive Rights, other organizations have been suing on them. So not clear at the moment that the Texas state court is going to be the place for that broader ban. But I think, I mean, the broader striking down of the bans. But I think that what we're going to continue to see is the, you know, block by block building in different states. Um, you know, South Carolina, we had a victory last year and then a defeat <laughs> from their highest court after there was a change of uh, personnel there. But I do think that the, you know, one thing for people to realize is that, you know, if, when I think about these state ballot initiatives, and I was in Michigan the night that the um, vote came in on the Michigan initiative, I was standing there with our long time client with whom we have sued the state of Michigan over and over again. And I didn't even appreciate myself, the like, like the relief that was felt, because it was literally like, we are never going to have to, we might have to sue Michigan, but we are going to have a constitutional protection that is not just, by the way, about abortion. They put in the Michigan Constitution protection for contraception, for, um, uh, for maternal health, for the whole range of reproductive health care as it should be. But you know, realizing now Michigan is dismantling right, all those kind of restrictions that they had. They're going to do it legislatively, and then we'll see what they don't do and what happens after that. But it is a change that never would have happened if yeah. the Dobbs case had not come down. So I think in the long run, and we'll see what Ohio's on the ballot uh, in uh, this November, also to enshrine, never before had the words reproductive freedom or reproductive autonomy, some states use one, some states use the other, 
been in a constitution. We were always suing under equality, suing under liberty. Now that language is built into three state constitutions, maybe four uh, after Ohio moves. And then we're looking at 2024. You know, Florida's looking at it. Missouri's looking at it. We're going to start changing the understanding of what the standard should be. And so that is, in the end of the day, I mean, this is going to be a fight for some time. But in the end of the day, we're going to end up with stronger protections for abortion rights and hopefully reproductive rights more generally than we had before the Dobbs case. I mean, there is no way. The world is moving forward in the last 30 years. 60 countries have liberalized their abortion laws. Only four have regressed, right? And that's the US, El Salvador, Nicaragua, and Poland. Just you know, last month, the Mexican Supreme Court yes. declared that the right to abortion, striking down their criminal abortion laws, uh, was violation of their constitution. Canada ruled similarly in 1988 and have not reinstated criminal abortion laws in Canada. We stand alone, those states that are banning abortion in North America. I mean, the trend, the Latin America trend, uh, uh, the green wave where we've seen liberalization in Colombia and you know Mexico and across Latin America. I mean. The United States, it's, just not, it's not tenable because it is a fundamental human rights issue to be able to make the own, your own decisions about your health and your life and your body and your fertility and your future. So it's going to be a fight, but it's going to be a fight we're going to win long, long. And, you know, I think we, can, we should learn something from the states that had the ballot initiatives because obviously there was a campaign. You had to have you know, commercials and mailers. They did something right that got the attention of voters in order to pass it. So I, th I think that here, the Democratic Party and those of us that are influencers, policymakers, we have to look at the playbook. I don't know what all the commercials were, what type of advertising, what the buzzwords were that scared the hell out of people so they went and voted. And so, I'm sorry. No, I was just saying, I think we, we need to examine each state and try to incorporate that somewhere in the campaigns of people that are running, like colleague Roland Gutierrez and you have Colin Alderid, hopefully will be Ted Cruz. And how do we how do we incorporate what those states did and incorporate that into the messaging of people that are running statewide? And I. Um, we all could talk about this uh, for the rest of the day. Um, but we do want to turn to the questions that the audience has. Um, my colleague Greta is going to um, squeeze in one or two before we have to wrap up. Um. Hello, everybody. Good morning. I'm Greta Diaz. I am a multimedia fellow at the Texas Tribune. And we got awesome questions this morning. But yeah, we only have time for a couple. So um, the first one would be, Last night on this stage, uh, New Hampshire Governor Chris Sununu said that abortion should be left to the states. What would be your response to him? Yeah, I don't agree with that. Look, look at the mess we have now. 18 states have laws in effect that restrict access to abortion. I think six others are in the courts right now. So you have almost half of the states. It's a uh, and you have different variations all over. People are crossing state lines to find um, the place that they can go and have a, a safe abortion. So no, I, I don't think it's something that ought to be left up to the states. Yeah, I mean, absolutely not. <laughs> I mean, we don't leave fundamental rights to the states. We don't say, let's leave it up to the states about whether we have religious freedom. Let's leave it up to the right. states about whether we have a First Amendment right. We're not leaving it up to the states about whether we have reproductive freedom. I also am not sure that the left to the states guys have fully done the long-term math on what that actually looks like. Because, and you can already see, obviously it messes with all kinds of laws. Look at all the stuff that they're trying to do about interstate travel and ban I mean, we want to get in, you really want to start banning interstate travel? You really want to start running yeah. on that? Um, you really want to start running on, on vigilante laws and, and that kind of stuff. But also, the movement of people between states, if you look at what Gretchen Whitmer, who, you know, as Nancy was just talking about, this resounding victory in Michigan, which is absolutely not a gimme, again, not a blue state, you know, there was a kidnapping plot against this woman. Right. Um, and the way she talks about abortion now is about bringing businesses to Michigan. 
And, it's, and she's doing a good job that when you were talking about messaging of connecting it to, to transgender rights, mm -hmm. to, to families being able to stay together and feel safe and like their rights are protected. And she's making a big pitch to businesses, move your companies here where your workers are going to want to live. You see the connections between all these things and you really want to live with your anti-abortion, you know, human rights restricted states and the various people and businesses that you're going to lose and the impact that's going to have on your economy, you know, maybe not today, maybe not tomorrow, but soon and for the rest of your life. I don't know that even the states' rights guys want that. Thank you very much. That, and that's a good point because we've seen it in Texas. Now, it's very subtle and it's not advertised a lot. But we've even seen it trickle down into the higher ed community where our universities are having a very difficult time. And this is before <laughs> DEI and tenure were under attack, but with the extreme laws. They've had a hard time recruiting the best and the brightest to our universities. Well, and I mean, well, recruiting OBGYNs, oh, yeah. doctors. We doctors don't want to come here. Right. You want to see birth centers shut down? Right. You want to see how, you want to have no places where you can deliver babies safely because you can't run an obstetrics unit? Well, and I mean, right. Texas is already struggling with that. I mean, yeah. that's like unrelated yeah. to the, yes. you know. Um, well, but no, I was also going to say that's happening in, you know, Idaho that yes. we just sued. They had nine fetal maternal specialists, right? People dealing with high risk pregnancies. Uh, in the state of Idaho, now that Idaho has one of the most extreme abortion bans in the country, four of those nine specialists have left Idaho. Mm -hmm. And so it is going to be increasingly clear in state after state after state that you cannot practice obstetrics the way that you should be able to. And, you know, people are not going to want to live in states where it is dangerous to be pregnant. Greta? Okay, thank you. Our next question, I think it's very important in terms of having the right information um, also. Um, what does abortion advocacy in Texas look like right now, assuming one doesn't want to go to prison or be sued? What, what does abortion advocacy, advocacy look like, yeah. um, it, it, despite like the challenges of speaking out and the fears around that? Right, yes. Yeah. Senator Alvarado, I mean, what have you seen in terms of, I mean, um, we've seen the abortion funds go to court to say, you know, we want our right to able to help people travel out of state protected. I mean, what are you seeing in terms of, yeah, like advocates are you mm -hmm. swelling support? I think people are encouraged by what they've seen happen in other states. And I think as we get closer to November, the 28th year court date, I think we need to build some momentum around that. Maybe that's when we hit the streets, but there has to be some information out there, some push because to most people, it'll just be another, you know, lawsuit in Texas because we're always getting sued, right? Um, so we can't just, we can't let that opportunity go. We have to rev up and be ready and be ready what, you know, post the um, November 28th. But we have to um, make sure our folks are informed as we get ready for the 2024 elections and we'll have a very competitive, hopefully, uh, Senate race in the general election. So we, we've got time. And this is, again, this is not a sprint. It's a marathon. So we have to be more organized and more energized. If I could just put in a plug right here for how you can get uh, good information about what's going on. At the Center for Reproductive Rights, if you, and you can text right now, hmm. you can text to 73776. 73776, and just put in the word forward, and it'll take you to our website for the forward fight with lots of information, lots of links to other organizations, links to how you can help support the, you can help support the abortion funds and the other people who are supporting uh, uh, the facilities for people to be able to get abortions, information about what's happening in the states. But, you know, it is legal to leave the state of Texas to get an abortion in another state. It is legal to speak out and talk about what is happening. So it's really important that people not be intimidated uh, by the unfortunate, you know, criminalization of abortion here in the state of Texas. Perfect. We'll do we one have, more. Brad. I think, time for one more, maybe two. Um, given that the conservative majority in the Supreme Court has overturned Roe and Casey, do you believe contraceptives are next? And if so, how would the state of Texas respond? Rebecca, why don't you tell us about like where you think contraception fits mm -hmm. in sort of the conservative legal strategy? Well, it's already in there. I mean, it's not like, oh, contraception is next. 
there are already measures being taken in states around the country to ban all kinds of forms of contraception that are being classified as abortifacients. And um, I would say a terrific resource uh, is uh, actually Jessica Valenti's newsletter, Abortion Every Day. She's tracking this. It's, it's a terrific resource for me as a journalist um, because every day she is tracking. I read it every day. It's really remarkable. And it's where I learn so much because... You know, this is this is a huge part of my job, and I can't keep up with what's happening in every state because the aforementioned creativity of the anti-abortion right is really a thing to behold. And um, so, in terms of where it is, and Nancy may know the specific legal cases at this point better than I do, but there is absolutely Plan B. There, are, I mean, the, the coming for contraception is not a future prospect; it is a current prospect. But also, it's important to note that in his concurrence for Dobbs. Clarence Thomas outlined the cases that he thought were, and I, I gotta remember the language that we can correct the error, mm -hmm. is what he said that we made in other cases. And those cases included Griswold, which made contraception legal for married people. Eisenstadt v. Baird made it separately <laughs> legal for single people, just so you know, later, several years later. Um, Lawrence and uh, Obergfell. So all of those have to do with intimate relationships, partnership, the, the, the control of family and partnering. Lawrence um, being the anti-sodomy case that he, originated in Texas. Right, and, uh, and, and Obergefell being marriage yeah, equality. Right. So um, it is very clear that the, that the conservative Supreme Court it has contraception in its, in its future sites, but it is a current reality in lots of places around the country and in various ways. And I was just going to say, I mean, just think about the fight that happened over the Affordable Care Act's yeah. uh, guarantee that contraception would be no copay because it is preventative right. health care. And that was obviously litigated all the way to the Supreme Court. And I just want to underscore what Rebecca was saying about they want to redefine contraception as abortion. So that is the way that they're going. IUDs, certain... Uh, certain contraceptive um, uh, pills. And right. they do that by saying that an embryo is a pregnancy. So again, something to take away today, an embryo is not a pregnancy. And you know this because people who are doing assisted reproduction, doing IVF, when they have embryos in a Petri dish, they do not say, we're pregnant. They have to go through the, right? They have to go through the process of you know, both having um, the in vitro uh, fertilization process, and then they wait. They wait some weeks to find out, am I pregnant? Because you are not pregnant until an embryo embeds and begins to grow in the lining of the uterus. But so, so you're talking I'll let that facts. redeference happen. You're talking but, facts, and, and, and that doesn't matter to the other side. They make up stuff all the time. And, and the right. word you can listen for, I think, is when they're, I've now noticed it's hormonal contraception. Yeah. <laughs> is it went from being just about plan B, which is, a, right, to being more broadly hormonal contraception is tantamount to abortion. I want everybody here who's ever relied on contraception to consider the vast range of things that could be classified as hormonal in nature. Well, and let me ask you, Senator Alvarado, I mean, you work every day with, um, you know, some of the most conservative lawmakers in the country. Do you think that um, that contraception is in their sights or politically, or are they aware that that seems... Yeah, we've had bills filed and luckily they've not gone anywhere, but you'll continue to see it. They don't give up and they won't stop until, I mean, they basically just don't want anybody having sex. <laughs> <laughs> And, I mean, and except themselves, <laughs> except themselves. Yeah, <laughs> but uh, <laughs> yeah, it's uh, right. But it's also I, I mentioned, uh, and Thomas mentioned Griswold and Eisenstadt v. Baird. I think we forget Roe was decided in '73. Eisenstadt v. Baird, I believe, was '72. Yes, and which is the single people's contraception, right? Congrats, oh unmarried God. people. You too can use contraception. <laughs> and Griswold is 16, 68. Yeah, sixty eight, late sixties. We are so not that far away from a world in which contraception was not legal to right. use, whether you were married or single. 
right? We just overturned a 1973 protection. We are talking one year earlier than that, five years earlier than that, for contraception. And, you know, we like to memory hole things when we fix them and pretend that, like, this wasn't a recent challenge. This was so recent in this country's history. Yeah. And it can, it, it is so on the verge of possible right now. And we cannot do what we did with Roe, which is just say, oh, come on, they'll never do it. Right. They absolutely will. Yep. And we also have to remember how long it took, uh, how big of a movement it was to get to Roe v. Wade. Yeah. The marches, the women that sacrificed, the people that were on the front lines, the lawyers involved. And, and to have it stripped away, we, just, we can't allow that. Yeah, it's, uh, we won't allow that, will y'all? Right. And just one of the most important things is that people make their support visible. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's not just in the country that the strong majority, recent AP poll again underscored that the strong majority of the American public supports abortion rights. It's also true it's the majority here in Texas. This isn't a case where tons of people's minds have to be changed. I mean, legislatures might have to be changed. Elected officials might have sure. to change seats, but not the minds of the people. It's just that you need to make your support visible. And we see it over and over again when you do what I do, that people come up to me and they tell me maybe what they haven't said publicly. You can be assured that if you make your support visible, you know, uh, put on your social media that you're at this panel today because you support the right to abortion, that's what's gonna make the difference. We've gotta make our support visible. We are the majority. Hashtag TripFest23. Um, we are going to leave our conversation there. Thank you guys so much for this. Let's give a round of applause to our panelists. Thank and, you. Um, Thank you.